thanks very much, and thanks very much for the opportunity to come and talk uh, about one of my favourite things, which is landing on a comet. I've never done it, uh, because I'm too big to get there, but I've been involved with a very big team of people who have, and I just want to talk you through uh, what it was like on the day we actually landed on a comet, because I haven't got time to tell you too much about comets themselves, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, why not? Um, you know, why, why did we want to go to a comet? The mission that I'm involved with is called Rosetta and a lander called Philae. And, oh, hang on a minute, I've got to look at the time, yeah, just to, just to make sure I don't go over time. And uh, one of the reasons we wanted to go there, one of the aims of the mission is uh, to go and see whether this particular comet um, was of the type of bodies which delivered volatiles, so water and carbon and stuff like that, to the Earth when the Earth was first forming. Well, for those of you who are here for the first talk, when Tim O'Brien was talking about um, galaxies and stars and all that sort of stuff, he mentioned in passing that the Earth was about, four, uh, about five billion years or four and a half billion years old. The Earth and the Sun and all the planets in the solar system are four, five, six, seven million years old. 4,567 million. Nice easy number to remember. And when, they, when we were all forming, it was a really active place. Lots and lots of impacts and, and crashing and banging into each other. And the surface of the Earth was completely molten. And any of the water in there, the atmosphere was made of steam. It was so hot. And we lost a lot of our water. Gradually, everything quietened down. And when asteroids and comets started hitting the Earth then, after the Earth had, had started to, um, to, to solidify, then they were adding water. And what we want to know is how much of that water and how much also of the carbon, which forms the building blocks of life, how much was added by comets. So how much of Earth's water came from comets and what sort of organic compounds, what sort of carbon-bearing compounds came from comets. So this is the uh, Rosetta mission, and this is the T-shirt of the mission. Um, it lasted, uh, the launch was in 2004, but a lot had been going on before that. Launch should have been in 2003, but um, there'd been a, a hiccup with the Ariane launcher, and so everything had to go back on hold for a year. And at that time, it was like, well, we might even have um, lost the mission completely, because if you look at what happened next, First of all, uh, it was launched, and then there was a gravity assist, and then a Mars gravity assist, and an Earth gravity assist, and then another third gravity assist. Now, what the, all this means is that because the, the rocket, the Rosetta space probe, was going so far out to try and intercept this comet, it couldn't go direct there from the Earth because that just takes too much energy, too much momentum required. So it had to sort of leave the Earth and then spin round. If you can imagine... Oh, I feel like I'm hula hooping. If you imagine a shot putter spinning, not a shot putter, a hammer thrower, spinning the hammer around like this and this and this and then throwing the hammer, all right? So they're picking up momentum. And this is what, and this is what the Rosetta spacecraft was doing. So it picked up some from the Earth when it went round it and then Mars and then the Earth again and then the Earth again and then out to the outermost part of the solar system. Well, originally, if we were, going to we were going to launch in 2003, and that meant we were uh, doing all this really complicated gravity assist and stuff, we were going to go to a comet called Comet Vertinen. Well, because the launch was put on hold for a year, we had to find a different comet. And that's why we went to a comet called 67P churyumov gerasimenko now, anybody who was going to choose a comet to go to that people were going to have to give public lectures about <laughs> afterwards would not choose one called Churyumov Gerasimenko. They'd call, they'd, you know, produce one called, I don't know, you know, Tim and Tom or, you know, Tina and Jane or something like that, or Smith and Brown. But no, Churyumov and Gerasimenko are the two astronomers who actually first discovered the comet. So, we were put on hold for a year, and then we were launched, 2004, and then we did all these things. We flew past an asteroid and took some pictures of it. We flew past another asteroid, took some more pictures of it, and then in June 2011, went into deep space hibernation, and then two and a half years later, came out of deep space hibernation. Now, in the January of 2014, 
coming out of deep space hibernation, it was of real concern. What you've got to think is that this space probe had been going for 10 years, but the instruments on board, they were delivered two years prior to the launch. So they were delivered in 2003, uh, sorry, in 2001, because they thought the launch was going to be in 2003. So everything was built by 2001, which means it had been designed in 1999, 1998, with that level of technology. So if you imagine the mobile phone that you had in 1998, ah, you didn't have one, have one. they hadn't been invented, or if you did have one, it was like a brick. Or you imagine the fancy little notepad that you had in 1998, ah, oh, your notepad, it was made of paper with a spiral ring band. If you had a computer, it was in a room all by itself and you had to book time to go and get on it. Imagine putting something that was built in 1998, with 1998 technology, in a deep freeze under vacuum for two and a half years, and then taking it out and switching it on and expecting it to work first time. All right, so when we had the Wake Up, um, uh, Wake Up Rosetta campaign in January, it was a bit of a fingers crossed. You know, is it going to wake up? Well, fortunately it did. We arrived at the comet in August and then landed, right? So in July, we'd got this um, picture of the comet. This is what it looked like. And the uh, scientists and the engineers who took this picture and looked at this picture, they had one thought. And that thought was, oh, duck, or, or a word very similar to that. And the reason they were concerned was because this was not spherical. And now, you need to know, if you're going to land something small on a comet, you need to know what the attraction is between the comet and the thing you're going to land on it. Because otherwise, if you don't know that attraction, it might bounce, and that would be dreadful. So you need to know how much this weighs, so you can calculate what that, what that force is. And to know how much it weighs, you've got to have an approximate idea of its density, an approximate idea of its shape, so you can get its volume. And this, we didn't know at the time whether this was one thing, and this was another thing that had come together, or whether it was one big thing that had had two great big chunks taken out of it. Well, we actually know now it's probably two things. So at the time, most of the engineers who were working on this said, right, mission stops now, we can't do it, because it's just too difficult. But, you know, everybody else, the scientists, got really creative, you know, who are all the really creative people, they said, right, OK, yes, actually, we are going to do it, think of a way around it. And so the engineers thought of a way around it, and they said, yeah, OK, OK, we'll, we'll land. Then in September, we got even closer. And the engineers who had been very concerned in July when they saw something the shape of a duck got even more concerned in September when they saw not only was it an irregular shape, but it had craters all over it, it had got lots and lots of topography, it was just a complete nightmare in terms of looking for somewhere flat and level and even and, and, and evenly sunlit. And they sort of said, well, you know, really, 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 you know, do we have to land on there? And of course, all the scientists associated with the lander who had been working on this for years and years and years said, yes, we bloody well are going to land on there. You know, <laughs> find a way to do it. And so, of course, the engineers did find a way to do it. And this is how scientists and engineers work. You know, it's just like, hey, we've got a great idea. It won't work. Well, yeah, actually, it probably will. You know, and it's a great synergy. And the two, two um, mindsets of scientists and engineers. Have I got any engineers in the audience? Nobody who's going to, oh, I can see one brave person there who's admitting to it. Would you agree that uh, en engineers are risk averse? Yes, yes <laughs> because they have, to be, they have to take the risk. And, and so everything is to mitigate risk, which is absolutely essential. And they're working together with the scientists. It makes a really, really great synergy. So, so there, where were we? Oh, right, OK. So we're getting closer, and yeah, we're going to land. So the day that I'm going to talk about is the 14th of November, 2014. And that day, 
was a day which is, for me, unforgettable. Um, no matter how hard I try, I cannot forget <laughs> it. Okay? So it started off at some time in the morning. I was in Darmstadt in Germany. Um, and the reason I was there was because I am scientific advisor to the Ptolemy instrument team. So Ptolemy is one of the instruments on the lander. Um, the principal investigator of the Ptolemy instrument, the guy who designed it and who led the team who built it, he's a very erudite, very kind, gentle, earnest, uh, very, very handsome guy to whom I've been married for 30 years, <laughs> <laughs> Ian Wright. And Ian was also in Darmstadt as well. Ian's team, though, the rest of the team, were in Cologne, which was um, a couple of hundred kilometres away. And so all the big wigs, the, direct, you know, the, the, the directors of all the European space agencies, all the uh, local politicians, you know, all, the, all the people who you know, felt had put money into all this, all the people from the European Space Agency and stuff, they were, they were all at this place in Darmstadt, a huge, great big hall, about, I don't know, four times the, the, the width of this one. And there was seating, you know, it, it went back about twice the length of this, and the seating wasn't raked, it was just, just flat. So all the, all the big wigs were sort of in the centre here. And uh, the press and the media were at the outside and all round, and, and the, you know, cameras and people on ladders. And the last time, the only other time I've seen the depth of media has been outside a hospital when Princess Kate is about to give birth. You know, it's that sort of, you know, number of press that are there. And so they were all waiting for this lander to happen. And so um, we had at... 10 o'clock in the morning, European time, Central European time, so that's uh, 9 o'clock our time in the UK, we got this picture, which is a picture of the Philae lander being let go from Rosetta. Now, it had got no power of its own, got no steering, no rockets, anything like that. On top of it, it got a little thruster, and the idea of the thruster was when it, when it got close to the comet, it would push, the thruster would fire, and it would push feli down onto the surface. And then harpoons would fire to anchor feli into the surface. Its legs would be out, and on each end, on the foot of each leg, there were like uh, crampons which would bury themselves in. So three fail-safe mechanisms. No way was this going to bounce. So it was let go. And then we had to wait. We had to wait until five o'clock, so seven hours, in this big room. And so Issa entertained us. Now, I don't know if you remember, when the Curiosity rover landed on Mars, it went through seven minutes of terror, which was, as it came through the atmosphere, there were going to be seven minutes when it wasn't communicating with uh, mission control and they were really worried you know coming through the atmosphere was it going to burn up with the balloons the parachutes going to fire and all this sort of thing and NASA made all this video you know seven minutes of terror with all the great music and all this and you know NASA conquered all and, and stuff like that well ESA does things much much better than NASA we didn't have seven minutes of terror we had seven hours of tedium we had to <laughs> wait you know there was like nothing else happening and so we waited. And while we waited, they played as a film, a film called Ambition. And I, I recommend it to you. It's really good. It's one of the first times that ESA has actually tried to do some proper PR. And they had Aidan Gillen, who, if you know him, he plays Littlefinger or Peter Baelish in Game of Thrones. They had him as the, uh, the, the master, and they had a, a young woman as an apprentice, and she was an apprentice planet builder. And it was really, really great with this stirring soundtrack. And it made you proud to be a European, proud to be part of this enterprise. But by the time they played it three times, you're, you know, you're getting a bit fed up with it. So we waited and we waited and we waited. And about four o'clock, we got a picture. And this is a picture of the landing site, which is going to be here, from Philae itself. So that's one of Philae's legs. Now, the landing site had been very carefully selected. It had been carefully selected so it was level, not hilly so that it was flat, not hummocky, 
Um, and so that, and that it had to have the right l level of light on it, because if it was in too much direct sunlight, everything would fry, all the batteries and everything would fry straight away. So it had to be in a sort of very carefully shaded area. So, um, so this was the, the landing site that had been selected. Now, four o'clock, so we'd been packed in this room now for, for six hours, and we'd seen a picture, and we've heard the, um, uh, you know, we've seen the film, and there's all these journalists, and the journalists are talking to people. There's these, you know, the, 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 the uh, great and famous. There's this little nugget of 11 people these are the principal investigators of all the, uh, of the 11 instruments that are on Feli, including uh, Ian. And they'd been interviewed, and then they were taken off so that they could go and talk to their teams, uh, who were, as I say, in um, Cologne, so that they could communicate when the landing signal came. So the journalists, you know, we'd all been chatting all day and mixing and... The journalists had interviewed the great and famous, and then they'd interviewed each other, and then they came and interviewed the Hoi Polloi, and they, you know, some of them interviewed me, and then they interviewed each other, and then they interviewed the great and famous, and then they, you know, and it just went on and on and on. And by about four o'clock, they were going, you know, it's, it's like, are you excited? Are you excited? Are you worried? Do you think it's going to work? Why haven't we heard a signal yet? Why hasn't it happened? And it's like, well, because they said, the signal will be sent at quarter to five um, Central European time, which is quarter to four UK time, because they work on universal time, Greenwich Mean Time. Um, but it takes 20 minutes, so we won't hear anything until three minutes past five, and it comes up, it's four o'clock, it's ten past four, it's twenty past four. Are you worried? Are you worried? Are you worried? Should we have heard yet? We? No, because gravity works. We won't hear. And they kept going on and on and on. Are you excited? Are you worried? Is this the most exciting day of your life? Is this the most worrying day of your life? And they went on and on and on and on. And the tension built. And this is the only reason I can give for why the entire room went hysterical. Not just me. It just happened to be that I was next to the BBC cameraman who took these pictures, which, you know, it's just like, oh, my God, this is why I won't ever forget this, you know. I've never been on BuzzFeed before, and I probably won't, <laughs> I probably won't ever be on BuzzFeed again. But it was, it was really, really exciting, really exciting. The only thing that was sad was that Ian wasn't there because he was talking to his team. But after about 10 minutes, everybody had calmed down and stuff like that, and the principal investigators started coming out of wherever they'd been. And Ian came out, and I went up to him, and I hugged him, put my arms around him. He put his arm around me, and I said to him all the things that the journalist had said to me, you know, isn't it fantastic? You know, were you worried? Are you excited? And he put his cheek next to mine, and he whispered in his ear, keep smiling, it's all gone tits up. <laughs> At which point you think, all oh, right, OK, what's gone wrong? <laughs> and what had gone wrong was that they seen, the, the teams had seen straight away, they'd got the signal, Feli's down, hooray, oh, shit, Feli's bounced. Because that's what happened. Feli landed, and then Feli bounced. And Feli bounced between three and four times. We're not, uh, you know, it, it's uh, still a bit uh, up in the air, as it were, probably three times. Didn't land where it should have done and actually landed on its side. So it should have landed like this, and it actually landed like that. And it transpires that the thruster didn't work, the harpoons didn't work, and because they didn't work, the claws on the, the feet couldn't work. So that was a bit of a shame. Well, the science went on, and this is a picture of the Ptolemy instrument here. It's the size of a shoebox. And this is the deputy PI, Andy, um, for scale. These are two tanks which contain helium. And what this instrument does is it takes in the air or the vacuum or whatever, the surrounding atmosphere, and sniffs. So if there's any dust in there, it takes it all in and it's carried through by helium, by this gas. And it goes through a whole series of gubbins, which is over here, and then it goes into some uh, detectors. And what are detector, detected are the different molecules that are present. So carbon dioxide, water, 
other molecules, molecules with lots and lots of carbon in them, and stuff like that. And these are some of the results that were, um, that were published, um, where are we now, uh, middle of last year. And what you can see, they've taken away, oh, it doesn't say that, but we've taken out here the peaks at mass 28 and 16, which are the masses from carbon dioxide and water, because they swamp everything else. So you can see the masses of everything else we've got, which as you can see, you know, small ones are brown. We've got some blue ones. Peaks marked in blue come from cracking of polyoxymethylene. Now, I know you recognise that straight away. As soon as I showed the spectrum, you thought, by gum, that looks like polyoxymethylene to me. <laughs> well, polyoxymethylene is something which is, it's a, it's a polymer, you know, so it's a long, long chain molecule, and it breaks down. And the bits it breaks down into can then build themselves back up again into sugars. And sugar, sugars, not sugar, but different types of sugars, are things which actually form part of the DNA molecule. So one of the things we wanted to look at was to see if there were molecules on this comet which could be delivered to the Earth, which were the sort of things that DNA might have been made from. Now, what we were looking for were things that bear nitrogen, which is down here, uh, nitrogen 14, or again, masses 28 and 29. For nitrogen, we were looking for ammonia, which has got a mass of 17. And we didn't see many of these things. We were looking for things with uh, amino groups on to look for the um, forerunners of amino acids. We, there aren't any shown in this spectra, but we do have some small signals in other spectra that were taken during the 70 hours that we actually managed to get data. So a lot of data were got, about 80% of the um, science experiments that were planned for the first campaign were done on the main batteries on Philae. What happened then was that the batteries ran down and it's actually Ian's ovens which drained the last dregs of the battery of Philae. So my husband killed Philae. <laughs> or at least sent Philae to sleep because, because Philae had landed in an awkward place the sun wasn't shining on its uh, solar panels so the secondary batteries which were solar powered did not fire up now I don't know um, how am I doing for time I'm sort of running out a bit aren't I I can keep going can you set this video going or not for, for me yeah uh, yes. You can. All right. I'm just saying yes. Sorry. It's not moving. Okay. Well, I can. Uh, what I can do is I can recommend this to you. Okay. Go and look for these videos. Go and look for the ESA videos on the ESA blog, especially if you're teachers, especially if you are uh, uh, teaching younger kids. Well, actually, it's good for older kids as well, which is why I was going to show it to you lot. But <laughs> they are really, really good. There's a series of four of them, and they do talk about Rosetta as um, the mother craft talking to Feli, her little lander on the comet, and they are really, really good. So this, is the, this was the uh, last one which took us through what had actually happened and trying to communicate with Feli. So, so the Ro Rosetta spacecraft kept going and came up to June last year. It was getting closer and closer to the sun, and as the sun sun shone brighter, then um, there was power to uh, Feli's uh, solar cells and Feli communicated um, with Rosetta on the 13th of June and for several times from the middle of June to the begin beginning of July. Unfortunately, the communication was not sustained. It was in short bursts and we think the antenna had been sort of knocked off not knocked off um, balance, or we don't know, maybe Feli had sort of shifted because ice had melted or whatever. Um, Rosetta did that in early October. It's now between, it's probably about 40 kilometres from the nucleus, okay? But we've moved, we've gone through perihelion, we've gone, gone through closest approach and we've moved a long, long way away from the sun now. It's back in the dark. Um, there is almost certainly insufficient sun to keep uh, Feli's batteries charged up. So last week, ESA announced that the Feli mission had finished and Feli was now facing eternal hibernation. Doesn't that sound, doesn't that sound sadly biblical? 
So Philae's gone into eternal hibernation. There will be a controlled landing of Rosetta on the comet in September, and we're hoping that from about mid-August onwards, Rosetta will be about 10 kilometres over the surface of Rosetta. Uh, it, hadn't been, it had to get further away, you see. There was so much dust coming off Rosetta, uh, sorry, so much dust coming off the comet when Rosetta was, was close by when the comet was near the sun that Rosetta was disorientated and couldn't see where, where it was going. So there'll be a controlled landing in September and we're hoping that there might be some pictures of Philae as Rosetta orbits the comet from much more closely in before doing this controlled landing. It's probably not going to do a controlled landing near Philae so that we can go and explore a second part of the comet. But that's what it was like to explore a comet, just to give you an idea of some of the experiences I had. At the moment, we're very, very busy with the data, learning lots and lots of things about comets, which is brilliant, and we're still trying to figure out how much of the water came to the Earth from comets. Thank you very much.